Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and in this video, it's really going to be less of a podcast and more of a single topic rant slash analysis of a new story that just came out about intermittent fasting and its link to cardiovascular mortality. So by now, I suspect that most of you have seen the article on whatever your new source of choice is on how intermittent fasting has a 91% greater likelihood of cardiovascular mortality than regular eating. If you haven't, you can just do a Google search on intermittent fasting and cardiovascular mortality, and you will see plenty. I also suspect that there are other YouTubers who have already made similar videos to this, I haven't watched them because I didn't want it to bias my opinions here. And I suspect that a number of these people are smarter than I am. However, I can hold my own when it comes to statistical analytics, as that's what I did for the better part of my career. And that is going to be the approach that I take as I look at this. So for starters, a little bit of background about me. I haven't always been just a knucklehead on YouTube with a large t-shirt collection. There was a time when I was in charge of certifying all Lean Six Sigma projects for the better part of GE Capital, GE Healthcare, and Cooper Power Systems. So I have reviewed hundreds upon hundreds of green belt and black belt and master black belt projects. Now, if this is kind of going over your head already, I apologize. But Six Sigma is a methodology, a continuous improvement methodology that is steeped in statistical analytics. And there are five phases to it. Define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Now for the sake of this study, there's only define, measure, and analyze. So that's what I'm going to cover, and I'm going to approach it the same way I would review somebody's project. I hope not to go full out stats geek on you. I, I want to try and make this accessible and digestible. So with that out of the way, let's get going. And I'm going to need my reading glasses for this because a lot of this information is really, really tiny. So I have here both the PDF poster that this particular study presented, as well as the abstract. And I will be referring to them both as I go through this. So starting with Define. Define is really, what is this project or study about? Who is involved? Why are we doing it? So it is the association of eight-hour time-restricted eating with all-cause and cause-specific mortality. And then they list the various academics that were involved in it from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Northwestern University, Harvard University, University of Massachusetts Lowell, and Wuhan. University. And I'm just going to park that right there. The funding on this was by the National Key Research and Development Program of China and the National Natural Science Foundation of China. Again, I'm not going to editorialize on that. So, here's the introduction to this study. It says, time-restricted eating has gained popularity as a dietary intervention that limits daily food consumption to a 4 to 12 hour window. Okay, first editorial. I don't really consider a 12 hour window restrictive. I think th that's, that's a pretty easy putt to hit. I wouldn't even call not eating for 12 hours fasting, but that's just me. Also, time-restricted eating is not a new concept. In fact, for the majority of human history, it has been the way we eat. It has been the normal way we eat. We didn't have time to get up and have a breakfast of Eggs Benedict or Cocoa Pebbles or, or whatever it is. We had to get out into the field and start working. We had to go hunt or gather or work in a factory from sunup till sundown. That's the way we lived, and it just didn't allow for anything really other than one big meal at the end of the day. But editorial aside, most short-term randomized controlled trials reported that eight-hour time-restrictive eating improved cardiometabolic risk profiles. However, whether eight-hour TRE is associated with long-term hard endpoints remains unknown. So their hypothesis is... 8-hour TRE is associated with a lower risk of all-cause and cause-specific mortality. So, 
I don't in the hypothesis see a specific bias, which is a good sign. But that is essentially the define aspect of this study. Next, they get into methods. And this is where things start to go a little bit wrong for me. First, they started with a National Health and Nutrition Examination Study. There were 43,849 participants in this. And their measurement was two. Two interviews over a median period of eight years, maximum 17 years, where they asked the participants to recall their eating window from the previous 24 hours. So we have self-reported data taken twice over a period of eight to 17 years. That doesn't exactly scream sciency to me. Additionally, the sample in this study that they wound up having was 20,078 people. So somehow we lost 23,000 participants somewhere. Why? Where did they go? Why were they eliminated from the study? It has the faint aroma of cherry picking to me, but I don't know. I'm just saying that's what it feels like when half of your original sample goes away. Additionally, there's nothing in here about how they chose to sample. Was it a completely randomized sample? Was it in some way stratified? How did they do it? I'd be curious to know. But already, just going through measure, this would not pass any sort of measurement system analysis. And what you wind up getting is garbage in, garbage out. Moving on, though, to analysis. And this is where I started doing a lot of face palming. In fact, I'm surprised I don't have a mark just from how much I've been going <sighs> like that as I read through this. So, statistical geek moment. There are two types of data, continuous data and discrete data. Continuous data is anything that you can divide by two and it's still meaningful. So, an example would be temperature. I can take 30 degrees and divide it by two and get 15 degrees. I can keep subdividing it into smaller and smaller units. I can go 15.3 degrees, 15.35 degrees. I can keep going to more finite and precise amounts with continuous data. Discrete data is categories or buckets. So if it were temperature, I could have cold, cool, warm, and hot. That doesn't give me a lot of info. It was hot today. How hot was it? I, I just felt like a Johnny Carson moment there. I was going to say, it was so hot that, but I didn't have a clever one to say. So if we have continuous data, that is a good thing. We want to use continuous data because then we can start doing regression analysis. So if you remember back in high school or college, y equals f of x or y is a function of x. In this case, the y is the mortality rate or they call it the hazard ratio. And x is the length of your time restricted eating window. However, Instead of doing that, instead of doing a regression analysis and plotting out the data points and seeing if I drew a straight line, how many of those data points am I going to hit? How close are each of my data points to that line? Instead of doing that and seeing is there a correlation and then, and then stratifying and doing multiple linear regression and stratifying by, say, age or race or sex or things like that to see if those variables are impactful, no. They didn't do that. Instead, they broke the time into discrete buckets. Those buckets are less than eight hours, eight to 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours, 12 to 16 hours, and greater than 16 hours. And for whatever reason, they settled on 12 to 16 hours of eating duration as their, their normal, their reference point. Then what they did is they compared the hazard ratio of each of those eating windows. And the hazard ratio, I guess, was determined by, what do they call it? The National Death Index. And that's basically how many people are expected to die at a particular age or, or something. I don't fully understand the National Death Index. 
But what they found is for all cause mortality, so any types of death, there was no correlation between your eating window and mortality. Additionally, they found that there was no correlation between the length of your eating window and cancer. However, they did find that there was a link between your eating window and cardiovascular mortality, which I, I don't know exactly how that's defined, if that's just a heart attack, stroke, what, what it is. In statistics, we look at what is called a p-value. If that p-value is less than 0.05, then it is statistically significant. And there are three instances where I see a p-value less than 0.05 on this. Each is for the eating window of less than eight hours, first in the overall sample, then in people with cardiovascular disease, and then people with cancer. Now, an issue that I have with this is similar to the issue that I have with the studies on statins and their effectiveness, in that the measurements are relative rather than absolute. So we have a 1.0 hazard risk for our normal eating window, and a 1.91 hazard risk for less than eight hours. So you see that, and you could say, yes, there is a 91% greater likelihood of mortality if you are doing this sort of intermittent fasting. If, however, you bust out a calculator and you look at the column labeled event divided by N, so that's the number of mortalities that we had, cardiovascular mortalities, divided by the number of people in that particular bucket. Here's what we see. For the reference group, we had about a 3.5% likelihood of a mortality event. In the 8-hour or less eating window group, so our time-restricted feeding people, it was about 7.5%. The difference between those two is less than 4%. Not 91%, oh, scary, 4%. Thing is, 4% isn't going to get anybody's attention in a news article. 91%, on the other hand, does. So from my perspective, we don't have a 91% greater likelihood of having a, a cardiovascular event by doing intermittent fasting. It's about 4%. Now, what's interesting as well, if I look at the percentage of smokers, in the 12 to 16 hour category, it is 16.9%. If I look at the number of smokers in the eight hour or less eating duration column, 27.1%. So not quite double, but a lot more smokers in that category. Hmm. What are some other categories that we're missing, in my opinion, here? Income, I think, would be sort of important because if you are lower income, there's a good chance you're eating crappier food. And incidentally, what food were they eating? I'd like to know. Were they eating a salad? Were they eating a steak? Were they eating tater tots fried in canola oil? I don't know. It's not in here. What about physical activity? Also not in here, at least so far as I can tell. And I don't know if it was part of their interview or if it wasn't. Why isn't it in here? That's a bit of a red flag to me. The final issue I have goes back to what I talked about earlier, which was sampling. If you look at the total number of participants that were in the sub eight hour category, it is 414. The number of participants in the 12 to 16 hour or reference area was 11,831. Now the fewer data points that you have, the less reliable your data tends to be. Now, I don't know if 414, if that's a valid number statistically, I would have to see the amount of variation that's in the study and, and the responses to really know that. But there's just a lot in here that doesn't really add up to science to me. Oh, two other things while we're at it. Nothing about this being a blind study or a double blind study. That's kind of important, I think, to, to eliminate any sort of bias. But it was not a peer-reviewed study. And even at the end of this study, they say that they need to do a repetition on it to try and validate some of this data. Now, to their credit, the American Heart Association has said, we don't, this is not us talking. 
this is these particular academics. So this is not a message from the AHA. Still, if you read any of the articles from the, the major news media, it basically makes it look like the American Heart Association is saying that this is a problem. Intermittent fasting, you're gonna die. So what frustrates me about all of this, there, there are a few things. First, I think the AHA probably should have said, no, nah, you know, th this is interesting and all, maybe mildly interesting, but this is not something that we're gonna publish. I think, I think they maybe should have made that decision. Barring that, I think the news media shouldn't have run quite so hard with this without doing a little bit of objective thinking. I only saw one article that seemed somewhat objective, and I think that was in the New York Times. But my biggest problem with all of this is then the uninformed people that read this, and I'm sure we all have the, these people in our lives, coworkers, friends, family, they see this article, they see intermittent fasting, higher risk of mortality, you're gonna die of a heart attack, and then they wanna come and preach at us that what we're doing is wrong. It's just, it, it disappoints me that there is such a lack of objective thought these days. And I hope that by covering this topic here in lieu of my podcast, that it arms all of you to have a, a, a better conversation about why this is just a, a, a silly, hot mess of a study. You know, you can throw all kinds of charts and graphs and numbers on a page. That doesn't make it legit. It was W.C. Fields that said, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit. And that's what this is. Mark Twain said there's three type of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Although it may have been Benjamin Disraeli that said it originally. Not sure. And having spent a huge portion of my career dealing with statistical analytics, you can get data to say whatever you want to say. And if you have an agenda and you want to prove something, you can prove it, no matter what the data says. And that is sort of what I feel went on right here. Anyhow, that is just my opinion, one person's opinion. Never take anything I say as gospel. Feel free to question. Feel free to question me as well. But I do hope you found it helpful, and that's why I dedicated an entire podcast to it. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, thanks for watching.